So therefore, each of these can provide at most one solution. So I get a bound of two. Now for this type, for this orbit, I'll pick p0102. You can see there's only three ways we can complete this. It doesn't take much work. It's very quick to determine the par uh, parity maps. And each of these meet the hypothesis of that parity graph lemma. As you can see, each one, each cycle has a center vertex in it. So that gives me at most three solutions for those. Now, for P0213, we get two parity graphs that meet the hypotheses, but two that don't. But each of these that don't, well, let's take a look at this. If I know this entry and this entry, then I get this odd, which gives me these odds. This odd gives me an entry in the center. So not only does it give me these odds, it gives me these four evens, and this even completes the rest. So I know that this map gives me puzzles, with, gives me at most four solutions. And similarly, this map gives me at most four, and this gives me at most one, and this gives me at most one, because they meet the hypotheses of the parity graph lemma. So I get a bound of 10 there. I'm not going to do the rest, it's similar. These were the four graphs I just talked about. You can see these two don't meet the hypotheses, which is why we ended up with four instead of one. Um, so this was the equation. We get these, we find these bounds, and we know they must be equal because that's the only way we can get them to add up to 576. So now we have fully the number of solutions for each of the puzzles. You see we get puzzles with one solution, two solutions, three solutions, four, we skip five, six, and seven, we jump to eight solutions. There's elements, there's, there's two different orbits there. We go to 10 and then finally at most 12 possible solutions. From this, we could even try to guess uh, how Brazen, Brian Hayes ended up choosing uh, the original puzzle. Like, for instance, if he picked six clues at random, we could say what the odds were of, of getting a puzzle with a unique solution. What if he picked the square? Well, it's better if he started off by picking a diagonal square to generate a puzzle. Um, but we could sort of guess how he, how he ended up with that to begin with. But I'd like to say what happens now if I change the group a little bit. So what happens when we change the pattern to a different group? Well, we only have one choice. We're going to keep order four. And there's lots of different ways to think about the Klein four group. When I need to, I'm going to use this uh, to do uh, group of units uh, in mod modulo eight, one, three, five, and seven. When I need to pick a way to think about it. But let's think about what's similar when we move over to the Klein four group. Well, we still need odd cages. As a matter of fact, we, we need it even more here because we end up with four solutions because we can add any element to each of the cages. Each of the elements squared is the identity, so if all the cages are even, uh, I can basically multiply a solution by any element in the group and get another solution to the same puzzle. So we still need odd cages, and we still end up needing that cage pattern that we had in the Z4 case as well. So the same, the uh, the little lemma that we proved that counts the number of solutions still holds. It holds over any group. We end up with the order of the group minus the number of roots. Now, it turns out if my clue is the identity, I'm going to have four roots. So I'm going to have four minus zero uh, possibility, four minus four solutions, which is zero. And in the other case, I end up with four solutions each. So no solutions if my clue is the identity and four solutions otherwise. But we immediately get this lemma, which is really strong and definitely not true in Z4, which is adjacent equal clues imply no solutions. For example, if these two are adjacent, we see that if I were to force a line here, this would have to be the identity. And we just said we can't have a two cage with the identity as a clue. So no solutions if we have adjacent equal clues. Another thing is I'm going to just define home corners and away corners. Um, a home corner is just going to be a corner entry equal to the clue in a corner of the puzzle. And an away corner is going to be one that's not equal to the clue. Now, it turns out that if a corner cell matches the clue for its cage, the other cage entries are equal to each other and not the clue, and that gives us three possibilities. And here's why. Well, if I put the clue in the corner, I know that these two have to give me the identity, so they have to be the same, and I'm done. And they also can't be equal to the clue. That's why there's three possibilities, not four, and that's because of the last square condition. For an away corner, we actually get a stricter uh, lemma here. The other entries have to be distinct and not equal to either the corner or the clue. So all four elements of the group have to show up. And this is because, let's look at this situation where x is not equal to c. Well, I know that neither of these can be x. 
And if one of these were C, then the other two would be forced to be the same because they would have to be the identity, and that would violate the Latin square condition. Um, so these can't be X, they can't be C, but they also can't be equal because that would force X to be equal to C. So. And the switch trick is even stronger over the Klein 4 group because I can switch any two elements with the other two. And that's because, well, the product of everything is the identity, and each of these elements are their own inverse, so I can just multiply this by CD to get that. So I can switch any two entries with two different entries. So I'm getting a lot of the same things that I did last time, and we can actually sum up what happens in this situation rather quickly because of that. So um, left multiplication only ends up being an automorphism in whatever group we're in if the uh, group element we're left multiplying but with ends up being the identity. But here, um, we can use the fact that all of our cages are three cages. So we don't need it to be an isomorphism. If I know that uh, g squared is the identity, like it is for any g in the Klein 4 group, uh, if I take the clue and I map it over, and I take the elements and I map it over to a new puzzle, well, g x y z is g cubed x y z. So this works out nicely, and these left multiplication maps end up being invertible. So not only does it send solutions to solutions, I'm also not creating any new solutions as well. Um, so what, do the, what does the left multiplication map do? Well, if, I'm, if I left multiply, and let's move over to uh, 1357 for this. If I left multiply by 3, I switch 1 and 3 and 5 and 7. If I left multiply by 5, I switch 1 and 5 and 3 and 7, and then 7 just switches 1 and 7 and 3 and 5. Um, so I get this group, which preserves the number of solutions when acting uh, point-wise on my puzzles and on my squares. You still are you talking about the 4x4 four case? 4x4, four 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 Klein 4, then, four right. So that's very beautiful in mathematics. Right? <laughs> you can do everything by both both. Because that's something. So I'm going to call this group N. And this ends up preserving the number of solutions. However, I still have the space of automorphisms, because we looked at the maps that weren't automorphisms first. And the uh, space of, of automorphisms is isomorphic to S3, and it's equal to those permutations. And we already showed that automorphisms are solution-preserving maps. So everything here maps solutions to solutions. And then it turns out that S4 is the semi-direct product of N and H. And just, you, know, you could just think about it as N and H end up generating all of S4. So we can extend this to the S4 action. So we have a much bigger group action. And we have the dihedral group still. We can still rotate. We can still reflect. So we end up with a very large group acting on our puzzles. And that gives, breaks everything down to these orbits. So once again, I'm organizing this by a number of di distinct clues here and then the stabilizer, and the order of the stabilizer, and the size of the orbit, and the number of solutions. And I've, I've decided that I would fill in these entries for you, for us, because uh, we have adjacent equal clues in those, those situations. And I know that uh, that implies no solution. So basically, we only have three things we need to find here in order to completely sum up what happens in this case. We get this, this equation from multiplying these two columns. And let's look at one of those three. If I look at the 1, 3, 1, 3 case, I know that this is 1 and this is 3. So this 2 cage, if I seal it off, would have to have a clue of 3. OK, well, in order to get a 3, I either need a 1 or a 3 or a 5 or a 7. So I get this kind of map without knowing whether the a's are representing the 1 and the 3 or the a's are representing the 5 and the 7. But remember, I could use my home and away uh, corner lemmas here. So if this was an away corner over here, this A would have to come from 5 or a 7. So that would mean these would have to be the other two entries. It would have to be uh, one from this and one from this, which would contradict the fact that these are both coming from B. So I know that this must be a home corner, either a 1 or a 3 from that lemma there. So basically, once I know that the A's have to be from 1, 3, and the B's have to be from 5, 7, this is the same thing that we had in Z4 with the odds and the evens. So we get something similar to a parity map. Now these green entries determine the square, which implies that there's at most eight solutions. And then we have our switch trick again. So we can switch the left and the right a column, the top and the bottom rows, and the four center entries. So this shows us um, that there is also at least eight solutions. 
So we get eight solutions in the 1313 case. Now we have two other cases. I'm going to leave them out in the interest of time, but I'll just say something. It's not, uh, we can show that uh, puzzles in, one three, in the 1315 orbit are determined by the value of any corner with one as a clip. So that gives them four solutions at most. And puzzles in the 1357 orbit are determined by the values of any two opposite corners. And those opposite corners can't be the same. Otherwise, it can't be completed into a solution. So that limits them to at most 12 solutions, and that completely determines the table right away. So we, this sums up exactly what happens over the, over the Klein 4 group. I'm going to leave you guys with this exercise. This was an almost lemma, which I found interesting. If you have a solvable puzzle with solutions, uh, the set of entries, or that's redundant, but the set of entries equals the set of clues, except for puzzles in the 1315 orbit. And those puzzles uh, have exactly one solution that violates the fact that the center entries have to equal the corners. But for every other puzzle, it works, and, uh, and there's only one exception. Uh, OK, I'm going to take the last few moments really quickly to talk about C5, what happens when you, when you blow things up a little bigger. Uh, I'm still going to require no one cages. I'm going to require the horizontal and vertical reflective symmetry. But I'm also going to enforce a maximum cage size of 5 to keep things from getting too ridiculous. Um, the number of cage patterns still blows up here. There's a lot of different patterns. So how am I going to organize the cage patterns? Last, in the last situation, we only ended up with five. Here we end up with much more. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to organize these by the number of clues it takes before all the values of all the other clues is completely determined. And then I'm going to list one representative from each class. So here are the zero clue patterns. You can you don't need any clues to determine what each of these clues have to be, because 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is going to add to 0. And of course, this doesn't have very much hope of having unique solutions, because every Latin square is a solution to this puzzle. OK, now if I know what this clue is and this clue is, just to sit, show you how I'm organizing this, I immediately know what clue I would need here, because I know what each of these rows adds to. And I know that this must be 0 and this must be 0. This cage pattern has no chance of unique solutions, because I can always switch the bottom and the top here. For the four clue patterns, it's sort of obvious that three of these have no solutions. I can switch these two columns if I have a solution, and that will map solutions to the solutions. In the bottom here, I can switch the top and the bottom rows, and that shows that we don't have unique solutions. Over here, it's not quite as obvious, but every puzzle ends up, it's not hard to show that every puzzle has to have at least 72 solutions in this case. And this might look like it violates my uh, no cages bigger than size 5, but this is representing a whole class of puzzles. So this is really representing the puzzles with lines here and the puzzles with lines there as well. So when you get to six clues, you still get no puzzles with unique solutions. This one I can switch to the top and the bottom. I can switch the second and third rows here to get a new solution if I have one solution. But once I get to the final the eight clue patterns, I'm starting to get some unique solutions. Now down here in the bottom, I can switch the first two columns to turn a solution into a new solution. So this one doesn't have any hope. But the other three all produce unique solutions. So let's just, I, don't, I know I don't have a lot of time, but let's just talk a little bit about these puzzles. So this cage pattern ends up giving me solutions, uh, puzzles with one through six solutions, skips seven, skips nine, 10, and 11, and has puzzles with 12 solutions. And we have 13, over 13,000 puzzles with unique solutions. No, it's not in the OAIS. I mean, these, these kind of end, but I can fill it in with zeros after that. that that's, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Zeros afterwards. Each of these could be in the OAIS. Um, no, it's, it's too finite. <laughs> uh, this, this cage pattern ends up with. Uh, 35,000 puzzles with unique solutions, and uh, puzzles with solution numbers uh, skipping 10 and then jumping to 11 here. And then for the 10th cage pattern here, for the final one, this is the richest of the cage patterns in the Z5 case. We end up with solutions from 1 through 13 possible solutions, and we end up with 2,000 puzzles that have unique solutions here. So. 
Um, just really quickly, what happens when we, we do the same tricks that we, we did before? Well, the automorphism group ends up being Z4. And then we can allow things to act pointwise on the squares and puzzles if we add to the two cages without adding to the five cages. This is going to preserve the number of solutions. Obviously, if I add one to each of these five, I need to leave these unchanged. So that also preserves the number of solutions. What we can do is we can take solutions and we can switch the second and the fourth rows. to. And there's a dependency amongst the clues here that gives us a similar action on the puzzles that preserves the number of solutions. And then finally, we can still rotate and flip. We can't rotate 90 degrees, but we can rotate 180 degrees. So we put all of that together and we get a group of order 160. Unfortunately, there's enough puzzles that still makes this very, very large. But the puzzles with unique solutions fall into 13 of these orbits only. So I actually have uh, a handout here. Ah, there. I have a handout here, so you guys can try one puzzle from each of the orbits. You can see that when you're actually solving them, the, uh, the information that ends up being immediately given does feel different in each of these different orbits. So uh, this is uh, something you guys can try uh, later on. You can take that with you. Now, when you start to get to the Z6 and, and the D3 case, just sort of the number of cage patterns blows up a lot. I tried putting some, some restrictions that made it kind of tight in my opinion, and I already got 170 cage patterns in the, in the tightest one, so that seemed rather arbitrary to start, to start settling down on these and, and doing that in the Z6. So with that, I'm going to end this here. I'm going to submit them to New York Times. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a good idea. Other question? Can you do it for final spills? So you did only a, a right. You do it with two operations. Yeah, I like that idea. I haven't thought with about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Ken Ken puzzle standard division is possible. You know, uh, when when they do they do do that in the New York Times puzzles and everything like that. So yeah, no, I hadn't thought about tossing in a second operation and, and trying to classify. You're not dreaming about these are. Hmm? You're not dreaming about these are. Oh, I, I, I definitely <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> we really so, into it. So, some of the uh, OEIS people were contributing th things that were infinite pseudo pools. That way you get rid of the boundary. And uh, I can tell you about that. So, uh, well, thanks for a beautiful talk. <laughs> I'll see you next semester. Thank you.